Hello, welcome to Ocular Ultrasound. My name's Matt Line. Let's begin. Our learning objectives are to describe how to perform ocular ultrasound, to cite the indications for ocular ultrasound, to list the conditions which can be diagnosed using ultrasound, and to describe the sonographic features of a common eye pathology. So why do you want to use ultrasound? Well, it's bedside, so you can perform it at the patient's bedside or even in out-of-hospital settings. It's more sensitive than physical exam and gives you a lot more information. It is easier to use than an indirect ophthalmoscope. And it is safe, whereas physical exam may not be safe in some cases, such as in a globe penetration. And for most applications, it's highly sensitive. So when do you want to use it? Well, I typically use it when there's an acute change in vision. Usually this is a unilateral change of vision as bilateral changes in vision are generally not related to the eye itself. Whenever there's an acute ocular injury or suspected ocular injury. Whenever there's altered mental status or confusion in the patient. Or when I suspect that there may be elevated intracranial pressure. To set up your machine correctly, you need to use a linear probe. Linear probes are high frequency and they give very detailed resolution. So they're the best resolution probe we have. They're typically from 10 to 5 megahertz or even up to 12 to 14 megahertz. The higher the megahertz, the better the picture. However, if you only have a 10 megahertz probe, this is quite adequate. Some people wonder how to do this on a patient. Well, the patient is going to be conscious, so pain control is essential. Some eye pathology is quite painful, so if the patient is in pain, it's hard to get a good exam. If they're having vomiting, then giving them an anemetic would be particularly useful. There's a potential open globe. And cycloplegics are not necessary for the ultrasound evaluation of the eye. We image through the closed eyelid, so the iris itself is not a problem. And for patient position, I prefer the supine or semi-recumbent position as the gel stays in the orbital cavity better. You could do this sitting up or any other position, but in a semi-erect or semi-recumbent position, that's the best position for me. So, do you use a little gel or a lot of gel? This is a little bit of a controversy, but it really depends on what you're looking for and what you're doing. I generally use a little ultrasound gel, so as little as I can get away with. I take the probe, I put gel on it, and then I wipe off all the gel with my finger. The reason I do this is because it is difficult to get the gel out of the orbital cavity if you use a lot of gel, as the picture seen here. If you use less gel, it's easier to clean up. Now, if you use very little gel, then your probe is going to be coming in contact with the eye. And as such, you may be transferring pressure from your probe to the globe. If you had an open globe or a potential open globe, you would not want to do this. So in that case, you wouldn't want to use a lot of gel. And when you use a lot of gel, you can see a black stripe above the eyelid, and you know that you're not touching the eye at all with your probe. Therefore, you're not causing any extra pressure inside the globe, and you're not causing any vitreous to extrude out of a hole that may potentially be there. Now, the other advantage of using a lot of gel is that you can see the near field much better. So probes have a near field and a far field, and to have imaging in the near field, you have to have a little bit of distance between the probe and what you're interested in. So having that little bit of gel increases the vision or the ability to see in the near field. So if you can see on the picture on the right, you can see the eyelid very well, and you can see the tarsal plate, which is the hypochoic stripe running in the eyelid. On the picture on the left that's using very little gel, you cannot see the eyelid or that tarsal plate. If you didn't care about those structures, then you don't really need to use a lot of gel. If you're only interested in the retina and the posterior portions of the globe, a little gel works very well. If you're interested in the anterior globe or the anterior chamber, then you need to use a lot of gel so that you can float the probe above the eyelid. In ultrasound, you generally look at things in two directions. It is difficult to look in the longitudinal or up and down direction using a linear probe because the linear probe is often bigger than the orbital socket. Now, you may have a small probe and this may not be very difficult, but if you're using a nearly four centimeter probe as we have in the picture, the brow and the cheek limit the ability to touch the eye or get close to the eye with the probe. So transverse is generally the easiest to do Generally, you only need one view as long as you pan all the way through. However, I generally try to look at the eye and using both transverse and longitudinal so that I don't miss anything. Make sure to brace your hand on the patient's face so that you can gauge how much pressure you're placing on the eye through the transducer. So here we see the normal structures of the eye. 
when we're ultrasounding, we're coming through the lid. So if we look at the ultrasound image on the right, we have a thin stripe of black hypoechoic jelly. We're coming through that. Then we run into the lid, the tarsal plate, then the cornea, the anterior chamber. The lens is very easy to see, and we can see that as the hyperechoic oval-shaped lens, and the iris is off to the side. If you shine a flashlight into the eye while you're ultrasounding, you can see the iris contract or expand when you remove the light away from the eye. The vitreous body should be nice and hypoechoic. The retina is the posterior part of the eye. The choroid is just deep to that in the sclera. The retina, the choroid, and the sclera are opposed to one another, and you cannot distinguish them in the normal eye. The optic nerve comes out the back and is generally a hypoechoic shadow, which we'll talk about more in a few minutes. So here we have a picture of a normal ultrasound of the eye. We can see the eyelid. We can see the tarsal plate at the top. We can see the lens in the anterior chamber. We can see the vitreous is nice and hypoechoic. And then the shadow coming out the back is the optic nerve. The retina is the posterior portion of the globe, and it is generally a flat, hyperechoic line layering against the posterior portion of the globe. Here we've tilted our probe, and we can see the pupil. And as we shine a light into the other eye, we can see the pupil dilate and contract. This can be very useful if you have a patient with a swollen eye and you can't tell if they have a reactive pupil or not. The optic nerve sheath, again, comes out the back part of the eye. We're going to talk about this more of this later. But generally, to measure the diameter, we measure 3 millimeters back, and then we measure the width. The width can be somewhat challenging to measure unless the optic nerve sheath edges are very well defined. It does take a little bit of practice to get these well defined so that you can get an accurate measurement. Generally, you're going to vary between 0.2 and 0.3 millimeters, even if you are very accurate with your measurements. So there is a little bit of wiggle room in these numbers. We'll talk about more of this later. So here's the list of abnormal findings we'll go through for the eye. We're going to take each one individually. So hyphema. A hyphema is a collection of blood in the anterior chamber. Anterior chamber should be nice and hypochoic, and here we see there's an echogenic amount of material in the anterior chamber. Then this case is blood. Pus would also look the same. So you have to tell clinically the difference between a hyphema and pus in the anterior chamber or a hypopion. Retrobulbar hematoma is blood that it collects posterior to the globe. Because the posterior of the globe is surrounded by bone, any formation of blood there, any collection of blood there, increases the pressure in that space, so it's truly a compartment syndrome. And as that blood begins to collect, it starts pushing the globe out of the orbital cavity and putting traction on the optic nerve, then causing ischemia to the optic nerve and to the eye and leading to vision loss. This can be easily missed on ultrasound, this hypoechoic blood in the posterior chamber. And the reason it can be easily missed because they are both hypoechoic areas. There's really not good literature on sensitivity of ultrasound for this diagnosis. So use it with caution. If you see something, it may be there. But you really should suspect this clinically and then proceed to CT scan if you need to. Retrobarbar error will be found on some cases. In this case, we can see that the air is a bright, echogenic line causing a dirty shadow, and it moves with patient positioning or head positioning. It also moves with eye position. Uh, this could indicate a sinus fracture. It could indicate something else, but it's easily seen because air is quite echogenic and causes that typical shadow appearance. Globe perforation. This is something we all worry about when we see a patient coming in and they've uh, had a history of trauma or if they were hammering metal. Generally, a large rupture of the globe will lead to loss of volume in the vitreous. Therefore, you'll have an abnormal shape and size um, to the globe. You'll have an irregular pupil. And when you look at it with ultrasound, it will not have its normal, usual shape. There may be loss of volume, so you'll get buckling of the retina, the posterior structures of the eye, because the vitreous is not there to keep its shape. Make sure to use lots of gel because we don't want to put any extra pressure on the globe and cause any extrusion of this vitreous. If you have a very small globe penetration, say by a piece of metal that when you were hammering, there may not be any loss of volume. And as such, the eye might look perfectly normal except for the foreign body. Foreign bodies can be very difficult to detect if they're not in the vitreous. So metal is very bright and easy to see. Wood is generally easy to see also. It generally does not cause a ring down or artifact as metal does. 
However, it is easy to see if it's in the vitreous. Many form bodies, though, will penetrate the globe and go outside the vitreous or into the lateral wall of the globe, and they are more difficult to see because the lateral walls of the globe are surrounded by bone and fascia, and they are also bright, so it can be very difficult to distinguish a form body from the lateral structures. Therefore, if you see it in the globe, it's probably real. That's probably the form body. But if you don't see anything, you need to proceed to further testing, such as CT. Here we have a corneal form body. As we can see, we see the lid very well, the tarsal plate, which is the hypoechoic line going across the eyelid. We see the rest of the eyelid, and then we see the anterior chamber. When we look on the anterior chamber, we can see it moving back and forth. It's a hyperechoic structure. In this case, this is a metal form body that's in the cornea. It did not penetrate the globe itself. Lens dislocation uh, will occasionally be encountered. With a lens dislocation, the lens is completely removed from its apparatus and it's generally in, to, in the vitreous. As such, it's usually very easy to see because there's a lot of bleeding. We can see in this picture the uh, hyperechoic blood surrounding the lens is very easy to see. A sublux lens is more difficult to see as it is in its usual place when the eye is still. So you have to have the person move their eye back and forth. You'll see the lens move independent of the eye. Vitreous hemorrhage is also easy to see. This can occur with many conditions such as retinal detachment, central retinal vein, inclusion, trauma, etc. Uh, fresh blood looks um, like small dots of area of low reflectivity, and they're generally mobile. So if you have the patient move their eyes from side to side, you'll get swirling of the blood into the, in the vitreous, and it'll be easy to see. It may also layer due to gravity. So again, it's fairly easy to detect. And uh, one thing that you may have to do is turn the gain up so that you can really see it. Here we have a picture. We can see that there's something going on here. We actually have a retinal detachment. As we turn up the gain, though, you can see that the blood in the vitreous, and we has, as we have the patient move their eye from side to side, we see that blood swirling. This is called the washing machine sign. That is a vitreous hemorrhage due to a retinal detachment. So there's several types of detachments. There's vitreous detachment, choroidal detachment, and retinal detachment. The two that are hardest to distinguish from one another is a retinal detachment and a vitreous detachment. And a vitreous detachment may be associated with a retinal detachment. However, the one that needs immediate or emergent treatment is a retinal detachment. So making sure you know which one it is is not only important, it's also difficult at times. Therefore, you should always use conservative management when you're using ultrasound to make this diagnosis. So for a retinal detachment, you have a retinal tear or a short, reflective, linear structure protruding into that dark or hypoechoic vitreous. So the retina, it leaves that posterior surface and is no longer tightly adhered and it tips up into that dark vitreous. The retinal detachment is very reflective or hyperechoic and in the acute phase is very supple or soft and moves very easy with movements of the eye. So it looks like it waves. Note that a retinal detachment will always maintain connection with the optic disc or the optic nerve and the aura serrata anteriorly. Therefore, when it's a complete detachment, it looks like a V as we have down on the bottom left. A vitreous detachment will not have these connections and will not follow these anatomic norms because it is not a retina, it's part of the vitreous. And so you can tell the difference between a retinal detachment and a vitreous detachment to see if you see this V-shaped configuration. Here we have a picture of a retinal detachment. We see it's a thin, hyperechoic line extending into the vitreous. You see the vitreous surrounding it, so it highlights it. It makes it fairly easy to see. We're panning through the eye. We're checking the extent of this detachment. It stops at the optic nerve posteriorly, and it comes around to the aura serrata anteriorly. The gain is turned down, so we do not see the vitreous hemorrhage that is associated with it. However, as we saw in the uh, prior video, if you turn the gain up, you'll be able to see the vitreous hemorrhage. Here we are, a different view. We've switched our probe angle. We can see that that retinal detachment is coming anteriorly. It can be easily missed. Notice that it, you don't see it in these views. But as we slide over and we tilt, we see that hyperechoic line surrounded by the hypoechoic vitreous. And when they move their eye, it floats, flutters like a flag. 
A vitreous detachment is really just contraction of the vitreous and pulling away from the retina. This is in distinction to a retina that is separating from the blood supply or the choroid layers deeper to it. You generally have a hemorrhage when you have a retinal detachment, but you also have hemorrhage with a vitreous detachment. So you cannot use hemorrhage to distinguish a vitreous detachment from a retinal detachment. Vitreous detachment is not really a membrane, so it's generally finer and smoother than a retinal detachment. It is not hyperechoic as the retina. It will still retain the wave-like motion of the membrane, similar to a retinal detachment. Again, it can be difficult to tell the difference between a vitreous detachment or a retinal detachment, and they can be associated at the same time. Here we have a very thin, not so hyperechoic line. It does not follow an anatomic plane. It is going across the optic nerve. There is probably vitreous hemorrhage here. We would have to turn up the gain to see that. Choroidal detachments are a little different. Choroidal detachments are the deeper layer of the eye, so they're not as thin or as flexible as just the retina itself because the retina is part of this. The retina lays over the top of the choroid membrane, so when the choroid separates from the posterior parts of the eye, the retina is involved, but so is the choroid, so it's usually thicker, it's easier to see, it's generally domed and it doesn't move with eye movements. Now, a retinal detachment after a certain period of time or certain period of aging will also dome and not be as movable with eye movements. So it can be a little challenging on occasion to tell the difference between an old retinal detachment and a choroid detachment. However, the choroid has the blood supply to the retina. So if you turn on Doppler, you'll see the blood supply in the choroid. You do not see the blood supply when you have a retinal detachment because the choroid is not detached. So, use Doppler ultrasound to confirm that this is a choroidal detachment. Again, with detachments, be conservative. It can be difficult to discern a vitreous detachment from a retinal detachment using ultrasound. Always scan in two planes from side to side, top to bottom. Look at the extent of the ultrasound because a small retinal detachment can be difficult to see, particularly when it's on the periphery. Ask the patient to move their eye back and forth and you look for motion of the membranes. It'll also, if there's a detachment that's layering posteriorly, it will help move it off of the posterior structures and you can see it floating in the vitreous. This will help you identify the retinal detachment. It can be difficult to discern which kind of detachment it is. So which is it here? We see there's something in the vitreous. The gain is fairly high already. Is this a retinal detachment? Is this a vitreous hemorrhage? Let's turn the gain up more. We can see that there are structures when the patient moves their eye, they are also moving. So we suspect that this is a vitreous hemorrhage. But is it from a retinal detachment or a vitreous detachment? Very difficult to tell. Here's the same eye. We're looking out laterally. We ask the patient to move. Move. Oh, look at that lateral side we can see that there's a small stripe of hypoechoic vitreous that is posterior and we can see a little bit here so it's very far on the extent turn down the gain and we can see that the vitreous is coming around posterior to this retina so this is a retinal detachment again can be very difficult to see so if you suspect a retinal detachment and you don't see anything that's abnormal be very conservative in calling it a vitreous detachment because a retinal detachment is an emergency whereas a vitreous detachment is not. So ultrasound can be used to detect elevated intracranial pressure. The optic nerve enters the orbital cavity and as it does this it's enveloped by a sheath called the optic nerve sheath. This sheath is continuous with the CSF, it contains CSF, and as such, any pressure that goes through the CSF is transmitted to this optic nerve sheath, and the optic nerve sheath dilates with elevating intracranial pressure. So this can be very useful to tell if there's an elevated intracranial pressure just by looking at the optic nerve sheath. The technique that is described for this is to measure three millimeters back from the retina, this is the A measurement, and then measure from side to side the hypoechoic structure that is the optic nerve sheath. The normal cutoff values for adults is less than 5 millimeters width, children 4.5 millimeters width, and for infants less than 4 millimeters width. If it, there's any doubt it looks wide but you're not really sure, you can have the patient look about 30 degrees or change their angle of vision, have them look a little bit away from you, and as you do this, this will tighten up the optic nerve sheath and make the sides easier to see so you can get a more accurate measurement.
These values of five millimeters are quoted widely in the literature, particularly in the emergency medicine literature. But if you look in other literature, if you look in other journals, you'll find that that is probably the wrong value. A better value would be 5.3 or 5.6 or 5.82, depending on who you read. This study that's down at the bottom is using an MRI reconstruct the optic nerve sheath and the findings for this was an optic nerve sheath less than 5.3 millimeters is unlikely to be associated with elevated intracranial pressure. An optic nerve sheath greater than 5.82 millimeters has a 90 percent chance of being associated with elevated intracranial pressure. If you use rock curves the value is 5.6 so that maximizes sensitivity and specificity. So it depends on if you're using this as a sensitive exam, a highly sensitive exam to detect elevated intracranial pressure or if you want specificity. So the bigger the value you use as your cutoff, the more specificity you have. The lower the value you use, the more sensitivity you have. It's very difficult to measure within a 0.2 millimeter difference of the optic nerve sheaths. So you, there is some wiggle room in there. I generally use about 5.6 as my cutoff. But again, you have to look at the clinical scenario and see what's going on with the patient to help you. Now, a much better way of doing this would be to use 3D reconstruction. There are trabecular or fibers that connect the optic nerve to the optic nerve sheath, and these are not all the same compliance. So as the optic nerve sheath starts dilating, there are surface changes that go on with optic nerve. And you can see how if you were using a 2D measurement, you get a false measurement of the optic nerve sheath by looking in one plane. So looking for an elevated optic nerve disc is a much more specific sign of elevated intracranial pressure. As the optic nerve sheath dilates because of elevated intracranial pressure, the optic nerve also bulges into the vitreous. And this is the same thing as papilledema. This is the ultrasound equivalent of papilledema. This is highly sensitive and highly specific for elevated intracranial pressure. However, it does take time to develop. I don't know exactly how long it takes, but it takes probably several hours to a couple of days, probably closer to the couple of days. So if somebody gets hit in the head and immediately comes in and they have altered mental status, you cannot see this elevation of the optic nerve head or papilledema just using ultrasound and equate that with elevated intracranial pressure. However, if you have the patient that's had long-standing intracranial hypertension, such as pseudotumor cerebri, then you will see this elevation of the optic nerve head and that is consistent with papilledema. Sometimes you will see an elevated head and it's not associated with elevated intracranial pressure. You may see drusen, which is usually bilateral, a hyperechoic layer above the optic nerve head. This is not the same thing as an elevated optic nerve disc. You may also see an elevated optic nerve disc in only one eye. This is not associated with elevated intracranial pressure. This is a unilateral process and generally is associated with papillitis from multiple sclerosis. Here we have a video and see the elevated optic nerve disc. You can see that it's doming up into the vitreous. See that very well here. Also, if you look posteriorly, the optic nerve sheath is also wide. It's greater than five millimeters. Now, a few other ocular pathologies you'll run into on occasion. One of them is retinoblastoma. So retinoblastoma is generally in kids before five years of age, and they present with leukocoria. You can see that in the picture. This is the most common pediatric intraocular tumor. And when you look at this, the way you're going to suspect that this is retinoblastoma is that you're going to see calcifications in a mass that is in the posterior portion of the globe. It is often associated with retinal detachment. The calcifications are what's key here. Toxicara may be encountered in many areas of the world. When you have Toxicara, you have a granulomous reaction due to larval form of T. canis or T. cati. And this causes unilateral vision loss in children a little bit older, usually in the 5 to 10 years of age. It also presents with leukocoria, so it can be difficult to distinguish retinoblastoma from Toxicara and ophthalmitis just based on physical exam. The age ranges are generally different, but there can be some overlap. The way you distinguish this on ultrasound is that toxic hair of the eye does not have calcification. It forms little synechiae within the vitreous that can cause a retinal detachment. So these synechiae contract, they're attached to the retina, and as they contract, they pull the retina off of the posterior portion of the eye. So it does cause a retinal attachment, does lead to blindness. Generally, 
if you have the diagnosis made by ultrasound, you confirm it with serology, as you do with Altoxcare. Another thing that may be encountered in some parts of the world is neurosister sarcosis, and we can see this in the eye. Generally, this causes massive calcification. Here we have the twinkling artifact that shows that this is calcification. We have posterior shadowing that's very deep and very dense, and it's filling the eye. This is not the same thing as the calcification that we saw with retinoblastoma. This is much more dense, much more filling. You will run into melanoma on occasion. Melanoma will appear as a hypoechoic structure. It's generally in the choroid, or at least begins in the choroid. It may become bedunculated and be hanging off into the vitreous. If you put on Doppler, you can see the blood flow around it because it's in the choroid. Remember, the choroid has the blood supply of the retina. So if it's in the choroid, it'll have blood supply all the way around it. It can be a little bit challenging to see if it's very smooth or flat, but when you're looking, sometimes you will see these bumps. Turn on Doppler, see if there's blood flow around it. If it's not in an, a TB endemic area, it's more than likely a melanoma. Here we have a picture of one. We can see it's this lesion. It started in the choroid and it is into the vitreous. It's pretty easy to see is because it's quite large. And this is an intraocular melanoma. Here we put on color. We can see the blood flow around it. So it's definitely within the choroid and expanding out. This is a melanoma. In some parts of the world, TB is going to be endemic and you may see ocular TB. It can come in several forms large granulomas or abscesses, and these can mimic intraocular malignancy, such as the one we just saw, the melanoma, and it can affect any part of the eye. Tubercular uveitis is the most common presentation. You can also have choroidal tubercles of TB, and these are generally small, less than three millimeters, multiple, and bilateral, and there's often indistinct borders. Choroidal tuberculoma is the one that can be really confused with a melanoma. These are generally solitary raised and large up to seven millimeters. The one we just saw was about seven millimeters and can be also associated with the retinal detachment. One thing you can look for is a well-defined wall and a uniform echo texture. Again, it can be very difficult to distinguish this from melanoma if you're in a TB endemic area. There are several other pathologies that may be diagnosed with ultrasound, but at this point I don't have images of those. So we'll have to wait and see those when we're in the developing world. So in conclusion, ocular ultrasound is not difficult to perform or interpret. Distinction between the various detachments may be difficult at times and may be a pitfall, so be conservative. Various other ocular pathology may be encountered and differentiation can be difficult at times, so get a good history and do a good physical exam and hopefully that will help you with better accuracy. Again, thank you for watching this video on ocular ultrasound. Mm -hmm.